Hey, baby doll, mama's got a job today. And it's the best job anywhere. Hey, baby doll, mama's got a job today. You ought to meet my boss, the bear. You know he runs the TV station. He got it from his dad. His name is Mr. Barely, but he really isn't bad. Grizzly's on the camera. Our director's Lionel. Hello. Dandelion brings us all the news that's fit to tell. Yes, that's so. There's Honey Childs cooking up a storm, you know. It's my face ring. And Captain Person does the kitty show. Hey, Brooklyn! I can't delay. So come on already. I can't be late today. See you later, baby doll. I'm on my. See you later, baby doll. I'm on my. See you later, baby doll. I'm on my way. This video is brought to you by the Nick Knacks Book Kickstarter. And by Patreon. Patreon. Meat lovers know. With Jerry Laybourne taking over as president of Nickelodeon in 1984, the channel focused on finding hip, fun, modern ways to break away from its old green vegetable reputation and establish a new audience of young people. However, this focus was mostly aimed at slightly older kids, the 7 to 14 year old crowd, with music videos, highly serialized animation, sketch comedies, movie reviews, and game shows. However, this was at a trade-off with programming for younger kids, the preschool and kindergarten set. Arguably the only programs for that demographic introduced in Laybourne's tenure up to this point were the Curious George shorts, which aired really early in the morning when most kids were asleep or getting ready for school, and The Adventures of the Little Prince, which had been given a really dumbed-down dub for the kiddies. Bell and Sebastian sometimes gets labeled as such, as it would wind up on the Nick Jr. block, but it's more of an all-ages show than specifically a preschool program. There were still eight-year-old pinwheel reruns, two hours every weekday, and new episodes of today's special were still coming in from Canada, but if you were between the ages of three and six, pickings were becoming slim. This seemed to change in 1987, a year that would introduce four programs for the preschool set to various levels of success. Two live action, two animated, an influx that would prepare the channel for the creation of the Nick Jr. block in 1988. The first of these four would make its premiere on March 16th in the lovely 9 a.m. time slot, and it had a pretty big name in children's television attached to it. It's too bad there was just so little of it. This is The Sherry Show. When The Sherry Show spotlight goes on, ah! oh! I'm gonna sail upon you'll enjoy music, Let's walk dancing feet, together. daring feats, on our cameras, oh. you'll see real drama. Barely, barely. Try my supersonic tonic. Wanna feel good? Watch The Sherry Show. Tuesday at 3.30 on Channel 5 WMAQ-TV. Now this is an obscure one. Originally premiering in syndication for exactly five NBC-owned stations in September of 1975, the Sherry Show was a series of 12 half-hour specials that was almost certainly pitched as, what if we made a children's puppet show version of the Mary Tyler Moore Show? Ventriloquist Sherry Lewis plays, well, she plays everybody, but she also plays Sherry, a single mother working at the local television station, Barely Broadcasting, as the personal assistant to the station's owner, Mr. Barely, an easily frustrated little guy who inherited the station from his father. Now, Sherry, I'm going out, and I'm leaving you in charge. Really, Mr. Barely, all I seem to have done so far is cause trouble, dislike, jealousy, resentment. What is my job around here anyway? To keep peace amongst the employees. Oh, wonderful. And in the meantime, you're making me look good. The cast of characters in The Sherry Show are quite expansive, and all of them are voiced by Sherry Lewis. There's too many to talk about, but highlights include Lionel, station director, who moonlights as an actor for the stage, performing the works of Shakespeare. Well, usually you do a television show in a studio, you know, and you can't hear the laughter because the audience is sitting in their own homes. Yes, that's very true. Mm. You can't hear them applaud and you can't hear them cry. Oh, I do long to hear an audience cry. Well, some of the things you've done at Barely Broadcasting would make anybody cry. Thank you. I think. There's Captain Person, 
the kangaroo star of the station's hit children's show, a clear homage to Captain Kangaroo. What are you doing? You're, oh, you're knocking the oh, You're taking your pencil and you're closing up the sea. Why did you do that? And now you're turning the paper over. Oh, now it says M-O-O. Moo, the cow said moo. Isn't that cute? <laughs> and there's Honey Childs, the resident TV chef, showing the kitties all sorts of fun treats to make. Hi, y'all. Today we're gonna make zebra sandwiches. Now, zebra? as you all know, a zebra is a horse that gets up in the morning and just won't take off his pajamas. Zebra? But I'll tell you a secret, we're not using real zebra. Oh, <laughs> thank oh, goodness. Silly. <clears throat> no, these are made from cream cheese and pumpernickel bread. I adore pumpernickel because it's tasty, nutritious, and it don't show the dirt. And of course, we get to see Sherry's own child. And as far as I can tell, this isn't an adoption thing. The implication is that human being Sherry Lewis gave birth to this puppet. While mom is at work, baby doll is being taken care of by Aunt Artica. A roly-poly... snow woman? Question mark? Maybe she's supposed to be a yeti? Come on, baby doll. <laughs> Come on, here comes a little car. <laughs> Open up the little garage. Come on. <laughs> Try an airplane, Sherry. She had three cars for lunch. <laughs> Come. Oh, but of course, it wouldn't be a Sherry Lewis joint without her trademark character, Lamb Chop. Oh, what's the name of this play, anyhow? Romeo and Juliet. Hmm, nothing fancy, but it does get all the names in. Very true. Did you write this play? No, no. Oh, I I'm sorry, I didn't mean to answer, but uh, Romeo and Juliet was written by William Shakespeare. Oh, did you get him to write it especially for us? No, Shakespeare is dead. How do you like that? You miss the six o'clock news, you just don't know what's going on. William Shakespeare has been dead for 350 years. <gasps> I didn't even know he was sick. As iconic as she is, Lamb Chop seems a little out of place here. She's traditionally a tiny sock puppet with minimal articulation and no visible eyes. While the cast of new characters for this show are huge, colorful, bright-eyed, Muppet-esque puppets. And we'll get into this in a bit, but this Lamb Chop is the more grown-up, oft-sardonic, Las Vegas live show version, rather than the still witty but more childlike version you might have seen in other shows. Lamb Chop doesn't have a set role here. She doesn't work for the station. She's just a person that Sherry runs into from time to time. I've been bitten by the kissing bug, the kissing bug, the kissing bug. I've been bitten by the kissing bug. All I want to do is wanna kiss, wanna kiss, wanna kiss, 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 wanna kiss, 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 wanna kiss, wanna kiss, wanna kiss, 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 the bug bit me like this. Ow! And so our cast of colorful characters take to the challenges of running a television station. Captain Person's kids show isn't doing great in the ratings, so Mr. Barely gives Sherry the task of firing him. But she can't bring herself to hurt his feelings like that. One of the soap opera stars has lost his voice, and Sherry only has one hour to find a replacement actor. In order to one-up a bet with Lionel, Mr. Barely assigns the meek and clumsy receptionist Lolly Pincus to design a new game show for the station, and Sherry steps in to give her the confidence to do so. Lolly, have the Danish. I'll bite. Why? Well, I want to know why didn't you eat this whole Danish all at once? Y you have to eat it one bite at a time. Why? Why? Because a Danish is a big thing. Uh-uh. You said a show is a big thing. Yeah, so? So that's how you do a show. I eat a Danish while I'm working? No, no. You bite off one little bit of, of, of the show at a time. Honey, that's how you do any big job. One little bite at a time. You do one bite for the scripts, and one bite for the scenery, and one bite for the lights, and, and one bite for the contestants. And before you know it, I will have produced and directed an entire Danish. 
<laughs> yes. The inner workings of this television station are easily translated into easy to follow moral lessons for the kiddies on subjects like honesty, believing in yourself, and how you should try new things. These lessons are made clear at the end of each episode when Sherry closes with an epilogue and a goodbye to the kids. And here's today's comment from Bailey Broadcasting. Doesn't it make you feel terrific when somebody says, I like you? But how often do you say, I like you, to somebody else? Most of the time, we all of us tell people what we don't like. We criticize instead. Well, today, I'm going to keep track of the number of times I say something to make somebody else feel good. And I'm going to be specific. I'm going to tell you exactly what I like about you. Of course, songs are worked into the story. It's not a Sherry Lewis project if she doesn't get to sing. Here she is doing a musical retelling of Rumpelstiltskin. Don't you worry, lady, for our help is here. He smiled. I will spin your straw to gold if you'll get me your first child. Well, they made a bargain, and she promised her child away. And then the little gnome spun the straw into gold by the break of day. And there's even time for one of Sherry's other trademarks, the one minute bedtime story. Okay, here. What? Do it. Do what? Tell me a bedtime story in one minute. Okay. Once there was a silly old dog whose master had given him a bone. A big soup bone that silly old dog was very proud to own. Proud, that is, until she whiz. He came upon a stream, and there by the edge of a high rock ledge, his eyes got an angry gleam, because he happened to look down into the brook. And there, what do you think? Uh, he saw another dog with a bone in his mouth. And so, quick as a wink, he barked at the dog he saw in the water and opened his mouth, which he shouldn't have ordered, because the bone that he'd held as tight as he pleased fell from his mouth with the greatest of ease into the stream to disappear. And that is the end of the tale, I fear. For the dog in the water to which he'd objected, why, that dog was nothing but himself. Reflected. Yes. Boy, I don't believe it. One minute exactly. Oh, and it really works. And that's it. It was a pretty simple show, made interesting by being a syndicated show with only 12 episodes, an impossible small amount. You usually needed between 80 or 100 to be worth syndication. But then the Sherry Show premiered with an odd broadcasting model. It didn't air daily, it didn't air weekly, it aired monthly back in 1975. So those 12 episodes technically lasted you the whole year. The most interesting element here is the expansive cast of new characters. By my count, nearly two dozen of them. All of them voiced by Sherry Lewis, which begs the question, what was this project trying to accomplish? And where exactly does it fit into the larger career of Sherry Lewis? Once upon a time, Sherry Lewis was a big name in children's entertainment. I would argue as big as Fred Rogers in Captain Kangaroo. However, since her untimely passing in 1998, pop culture seems to have let Sherry Lewis fade away a bit. Part of that is because no one has continued her intellectual properties in a major way since her death. It's not like how the Muppets kept going after Jim Henson died. But even then, in the 22 years we've had without Sherry Lewis, there have been no biographies, no documentaries, no significant tributes, and that is a crime. So let's finally give Sherry Lewis her proper due. Sherry Lewis was born Phyllis Naomi Hurwitz. Sherry was a nickname she picked up when she was young. Born in New York City on January 17th, 1933 or 1934. There's conflicting sources on that. Her father, Dr. Abraham Hurwitz, was head of child guidance at Yeshiva University and in 1930 was designated the official magician of the New York City Department of Recreation under the name of Peter Pan, the Magic Man. Performing for playgrounds, summer camps, and orphanages, Peter Pan the Magic Man would use his tricks to teach crowds of children on matters of science, mathematics, and social skills. Sherry's mother, Anne Ritz Hurwitz, was the music supervisor for the Bronx Board of Education, and according to Lewis, an early feminist, hyphenated last names being a rarity at this time. As you can imagine, little Phyllis and her younger sister Barbara grew up surrounded by performance, art, and children's education. There's never been anything else. I started performing at 18 months. 
My parents were school teachers. They ran summer camps, and I was put on stage with a crepe paper bow, and we have film evidence of it. My parents encouraged me to study everything from juggling and instruments to acting and singing and dancing. Attending New York's High School of Music and Art, Sherry would learn piano and violin, and then dance at the School of American Ballet. However, her dance studies were postponed after breaking her ankle. At a commission for a few months and bored out of her mind, Sherry's father encouraged her to pick up another act. Ventriloquism. She took to it, eventually developing an act with ventriloquist dummy characters Buttercup, Samson, Taffy Twinkle, and Randy Rocket. In 1952, a young Sherry Hurwitz brought the ventriloquism act to the CBS variety show Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts. Yeah, if you didn't know, Television talent shows like America's Got Talent are some of the oldest types of programs there are. And like America's Got Talent, the public loves a young girl doing a ventriloquism act, and Sherry Hurwitz won first place. This was a huge, high-profile win. Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts was the number one highest-rated program of this time, and her appearance there opened the door for a number of opportunities in television and live performance. Around this time, Sherry also had a very brief marriage with an advertising executive named Stan Lewis. While their relationship was short-lived, Sherry would maintain the surname Lewis for the rest of her career. The first steady television gig for Sherry Lewis came in July of 1953 as the host of Facts and Fun, a 15-minute educational program for New York City's local NBC station. The fact that my name is Sherry Lewis, and that if you'll spend the next with me. I'll show you how facts can be fun, and that's a fact. Hey, hiya, Taffy. Well, hello, Taff. How are you? Fine. I like it here, too. Well, what would you do every year? You kidding? <laughs> we have some candy cotton and a toy balloon. And then in 1954, Sherry would host Cartoon Club, playing the mayor of the fairy tale town of Cartoonia, telling stories and performing magic tricks live to children, intercut with animated shorts. Sherry Lewis was already very invested in what made good children's television. Entertaining children on TV poses some mighty big problems. The programs they watch help set up their behavior patterns, their way of speaking, even their social attitudes. My shows are aimed at children from 4 to 10. These are the years when a child learns the difference between the real and the unreal. However, your classic ventriloquist dummy was falling out of style. Perhaps fine for the stage, but too stiff and expressionless for the up-close and personal nature of television. Already, people were experimenting with how puppetry would work in the television age. Sherry Lewis would have to evolve with the times, and the opportunity for that came in 1956, when she was invited to perform for the Captain Kangaroo show, so long as she didn't bring any of her dummies. So, from a sock and a few bits of fabric, Sherry Lewis created a new character, Lamb Chop. Lamb Chop was not a fantastic looking puppet, it was just an old sock. But when she put it on her hand, your attention would be riveted by Lamb Chop, not by Sherry. She was genuine, she wasn't acting. Sherry Lewis, with her red hair and pigtails and freckles painted on her face, would play the 12-year-old niece of the show's farmer character, Mr. Green Jeans, with Lamb Chop as her little pet. Her role on Captain Kangaroo was short-lived, but Sherry Lewis switched over to this style of puppetry wholesale. Her next project was another New York local show called Children's Newspaper of the Air, and it was here that Sherry would develop the other core members of her famous ensemble, Charlie Horse, the Brash Troublemaker, and Hush Puppy, the Shy Gentle Soul. Oh, and Wingding? Wingding the Crow was dropped early and is now largely forgotten, but not before the first wave of Sherry Lewis and Friends merchandise. In 1957, Sherry Lewis hosted two shows simultaneously. For children, there was Sherryland, an hour-long program every Saturday where Sherry, Lamb Chop, and Friends would read stories, sing songs, and present craft projects for the kids to do at home. <laughs> See you soon, May be in June. And then on weekday mornings, Hi Mom, a show designed to be watched by both toddlers and stay-at-home mothers together, 
with projects and recipes child and parent can do together, along with skits starring Lamb Chop and Charlie Horse. What do you think of my um, new puppet? Where, Charlie? Right here. Lamb Chop is your new puppet? Uh-huh. Realistic, eh? Yes, very realistic. You want to see me make her move? You can make your puppet move. Uh-huh. I'd love it. Both shows would win Sherry Lewis Emmys for Outstanding Female Personality. Most of this had been local programming, however, and while there are worse places to be a local celebrity than New York City, it was time to go national. And she would go national in a big way. If you wiggle them silly dough, them dilly, you fall it down, hey, down, dairy. So throw your willy way over your thistle and suddenly you'll be Sherry. If you hobble them bubble some wheat, them willy, then lamb chop will cut barley. So throw your willy way over your thistle and suddenly you'll see Charlie. The Sherry Lewis Show premiered on NBC on October 1st, 1960 as a replacement show for one of the first major hits in children's television, The Howdy Doody Show. Those are some big shoes to fill, but after hosting five television shows in less than five years, Sherry Lewis had this down to a science. The Sherry Lewis Show did much of the same things her previous shows did. Songs, story time, craft projects, and little lessons for the kiddies but now with episode length stories and additional actors, some of them even known celebrities like Margaret Hamilton playing Lamb Chop's babysitter. Except Lamb Chop has convinced Dom DeLuise in I believe his first television role to take her place. Mommy. <laughs> yes, Pepper. I want a drink of water. So go get it. Go get it. I'm only one butt. Get it Unfortunately, most of the show is lost. NBC failed to preserve it, and all we have are a handful of black and white clips, despite it originally airing in color. I am the President of the United States. You can't be the President. Why not? You're a girl. Didn't you know that all the Presidents were girls? President Kennedy isn't a girl. So, but one. That's not fair. Lance Yelp has been 35 presidents of the United States. Not one of them has been a girl. There you go. 35 presidents, all men. Not one could do the job right. If they had gotten just one girl, she would have been enough. The Sherry Lewis Show was well received and even won a Peabody Award, but it would only last for three years getting replaced by Alvin and the Chipmunks. Sherry Lewis got her big break, and now it is over. What next? And I think this is getting at the heart of why Sherry Lewis has kind of faded away in pop culture history over the last couple of decades, as she never just had one big project. Mr. Rogers just had the one big show. Captain Kangaroo just had the one big show. Sherry Lewis has a career defined by dozens of fun, high quality, but ultimately short-lived projects. And for the next 30 years, Sherry Lewis would have a lot of projects. Here are just a few of them. She did continue on television. In 1968, The Sherry Lewis Show found a new home across the pond on the BBC, where it would air until 1976. She became a regular fixture on variety shows, sometimes with Lamb Chop, sometimes without. Here she is dancing on The Danny Kay Show in 1964. She also had a Las Vegas stage show for about 10 years with Lamb Chop, whose character was aged up so that the character could make jokes about drinking booze. But honey, did you, did you really have an alcoholic beverage? Here's a martini and alcoholic beverage. It certainly is. I certainly have. And how did you get a martini? I mix gin and vermouth. Gin and 43 to 1, right? And then I have scotch bourbon and yum yum. 
Now what's yum yum? Anything at discussion there than yum yum. Sherry Lewis conducted orchestras, filling the shows with puppets and skits as a way to introduce children to classical music. She wrote dozens of story and craft books and published children records. She acted in adult television for shows like Car 54 Where Are You, The Man From UNCLE, and Love American Style. And she even co-wrote an episode of Star Trek with her second husband, television producer and publisher Jeremy Tarcher. The two would have a daughter, Mallory, in 1963. And it's in all of this that we get back to 1975 and The Sherry Show, which was really par of the course for Sherry Luce's career. A very brief project, throwing something at the wall and seeing if it sticks, and then moving on to the next thing as quickly as possible. But with her life story and past works in mind, you do start to see elements of biography in The Sherry Show. The setting of a turbulent local television station, the Captain Kangaroo reference, Sherry working and raising a daughter at the same time. There's one episode where Sherry goes on a television show, presents her talents, and is then offered a job as a performer. By this point, Sherry Lewis had been working in show business for just shy of 25 years, and as she was getting into her middle age, it would be a natural time to be reflective. Of course, reflection might be inspiration, but it certainly wasn't the point of the show. The point was to provide a fun little program for the kids. But I think more vitally, the point was to greatly expand the roster of Sherry Lewis's puppet characters. While none of the new characters in The Sherry Show would become mainstays, the holy trifecta of Lamb Chop, Charlie Horse, and Hush Puppy would remain intact, you would occasionally see a Sherry Show character pop up in one small project or another. Whenever an additional voice was needed, or you needed a puppet with functional hands, and oh hey, look, she brought back Wingding. Yeah, this is Wingding with your third eye view of your very own tornado. This is your average twisting windstorm with winds at 300 miles an hour, extending down from a mass of dark clouds. Now, tornadoes usually push rain and thunderstorms ahead of them. That's the first warning of a tornado, and I'm going to take that warning and get out of here. NBC was drawn to the show because of the Federal Communications Commission was calling for networks to air more educational children's material. Coincidentally, NBC announced The Sherry Show the same time they announced Vegetable Soup, a show that would air both on NBC and PBS, and years later, on Nickelodeon. And speaking of, fast forward to 1987, and we have Nickelodeon airing The Sherry Show. There were actually some crossed wires with the announcement, the Sherry Show was so obscure that some newspapers assumed that it was a new series from Sherry Lewis being produced for the cable channel. It was definitely an odd pick. A forgotten 12-year-old show with only 12 episodes airing on weekdays, meaning you only had two and a half weeks before you started airing reruns. Of course, Nickelodeon was no stranger to rerunning shows into the ground. In fact, at 9 o'clock in the morning, The Sherry Show was the lead-in to kids' rights during its sixth and final year of rerunning the same 17 episodes over and over and over again. Eventually, the show was moved to a Thursday and Friday only spot, then to a weekend spot pushed all the way back to 6.30 a.m., then quietly dropped after January 10th, 1988, not even a week after Nick Jr. premiered. So why did Nickelodeon even bother? It feels almost like a Cy Schneider decision. Sherry Lewis was still a known name, but her focus in the 1980s were mostly with television specials, straight-to-video projects, and stage shows. She didn't star in a single television show for the entirety of the 80s, so her name brand recognition wasn't the strongest in 1987. Now, The Sherry Show was okay, but not some amazing must-watch kids program. And if Nickelodeon just needed a show to fill time, Certainly there were things out there with more than 12 episodes that they could get the rights to. But something to consider, Nickelodeon was on a bit of an obscurity kick at this time. One of their philosophies going into the latter half of the 80s was to find and air things you simply could not get from network television. From foreign animation like Spartacus and the Sun Beneath the Sea, to older forgotten shows that had never been rerun, like The Bad News Bears. The Sherry Show was definitely obscure enough for this idea, but without any official press statement from Nickelodeon, I can only speculate. Whatever the reason, 
The Sherry Show came to Nickelodeon and was gone 10 months later without much fuss. And that's the story of Sherry Lewis on Nickelodeon. But of course, people my age know full well that this wasn't the end of Sherry Lewis. If you're into fun and you love to play, if you like funny jokes, they put you away. If you like to dance to a slamming sound and you like having lots of friends around, if you're one of those kids who lives by the rule that sad is bad and happy is cool, ooh, little buddy, you're about to see you're in the very best place that you could be. Hey, it's Land Chops Play Along. In 1992, Sherry Lewis came back in a big way on PBS with Lamb Chops Play Along. In many ways, it was back to basics. Sherry and her puppet trio, Lamb Chop, Charlie Horse, and Hush Puppy, telling stories, telling jokes, singing songs, and doing crafts, with a heavy emphasis on the child audience participating as they watch. Sherry would refer to the show as an anti-couch potato show, and it worked. Running for four seasons, Lamb Chop's Play Along would win six Emmys and make Sherry Lewis more popular than ever with children. Never not working, Sherry quickly followed that up with Charlie Horse's Music Pizza, a show about learning and performing music. Sadly, this would be her last project. Having already survived breast cancer, Sherry Lewis was diagnosed with uterine cancer in 1998 and passed away on August 2nd of that year. Since then, Sherry's daughter, Mallory Lewis, has taken over as the voice of Lamb Chop, but just for live appearances in the occasional internet video. No major media projects involving Sherry Lewis's properties have been produced since her death. Sherry Lewis lived a life full of creativity and creation, and deserves to be remembered as one of the great children's entertainers of the 20th century. However, a career of mostly smaller projects, most of them lost to time, have prevented her from being rediscovered by a modern audience of children, and we really should fix that before it's too late. As for The Sherry Show, it stands as both a footnote for the history of Sherry Lewis and a footnote for the history of Nickelodeon. Pleasant, and a bit more interesting when you know about the woman behind it, but not exactly groundbreaking. It was an experiment in large puppet casts. It was one of the most modernized things Sherry Lewis ever created, a children's show protagonist being a working single mother pushed some boundaries. It's just that nobody was around to watch those boundaries being pushed. But even here, in the obscure corners of her career, Sherry Lewis's talent shines through, and the amount of love she put into these projects is evident. May we all love the work we do, as Sherry Lewis loved hers. Nick, 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 Next time, we return to the world of Japanese animation with a visit to a quaint little village of anthropomorphic animals. You're all gonna die from an adorableness overdose. As I mentioned earlier, there's sadly no official biography of Sherry Lewis. Someone should really get on that. One book that was surprisingly useful, though, was Success Tips from Young Celebrities by Dina Reed. This 1968 book profiles and interviews fresh-faced actors and entertainers of the time, and the chapter on Sherry Lewis was very helpful in contextualizing her early career. I was only able to get a hold of this book thanks to the Internet Archive, which is currently being challenged in court by publishers who don't think it's a real library after overpaid Star Wars fanfic writer Chuck Wendig threw a fit on Twitter. It's a library, it's, it's not book Napster. Capitalism sucks. I realize that there's a lot of things in the world that take priority right now, but the Internet Archive is a very, very valuable source of information. I couldn't do knickknacks without it, so if you're able to support them in any way, I would highly recommend doing so. And thank you all so much for watching! If you'd like to support Knickknacks and other Paparina projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar will go to production values, research materials, and nachos. You can also support the channel by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, hitting that bell icon for notifications, following me on Twitter, sending a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, and sharing Knickknacks with all your friends. Take care out there. Black Lives Matter.